welcome to the Modern Homesteading Podcast. We have allowed ourselves to become so disconnected and ignorant about something that is as intimate as the food that we eat. Be prepared to grow your own for victory. God said I need somebody strong enough to clear trees and heave bales, yet gentle enough to yeam lambs and wean pigs and tend the pink foamed pullets who will stop his mower for an hour to splint the broken leg of a meadowlark. So God made a farmer. Well, hello and welcome to the Modern Homesteading Podcast. I'm your host, Harold Thornborough, and glad you're with me again this week. And i uh, got a great one for you today, guys. Uh, on this podcast episode, I'm going to discuss a few methods for controlling destructive insects in your organic garden and uh, hopefully give you the best chance for having a great harvest. And before we jump into that, we'll do our homestead updates, of course, and uh, talk about the front porch a little bit. But I'm also going to introduce a new segment today. I want to I want to just start sharing something that's better in my life because of homesteading. I'll call that that segment the homestead life. I think you'll enjoy that. I'll talk a little bit about that at the end today. But uh, before we jump into all that, how about those homestead updates? Well, I uh, had some really high winds about a week or so ago, and it done a little damage to my greenhouse. Actually, the uh, the vent on the top was opened up, and the wind caught it and ripped it off my greenhouse. So I had to kind of patch that together. I'm actually going to have to put some uh, hinges on it because it tore everything apart, and I'm going to have to kind of rig that up with some new hinges. But I'll be able to fix it. I found the uh, I found the hatch, and uh, I'll just have to uh, to kind of just do something a little different with it. But I've just kind of got it bungee corded down <laughs> right now. Um, and the weather has been absolutely nuts. We had a lot of snow. Then the next day it got up upper forties and no snow. And then it snowed again, then no snow. And now it's been rain, rain, rain ever since. So, uh, the backyard's all flooded. And, uh, yeah, it's been, uh, been some crazy weather. It really has. Um, I'm also trying not to get too excited this year about the garden. It seems like every year, I plant things way too early. I end up kind of overgrowing the greenhouse and, and then I, 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 I take things out into the garden a little early and then a lot of things end up dying because we'll get a freeze and, you know, and I don't get them covered up. And, and I'm just trying to kind of be a little more patient this year. I've got the, the, the hardy things, you know, the spinach, the lettuce, things like that growing in the greenhouse, but I'm trying to be a little more patient with the, uh, with some of my things like my peppers and my tomatoes and, and such. Cause I, I always jump the gun. And I plant. I will definitely be getting those planted here in the next few days. Uh, seed started in the next few days, but uh, I'm just trying to be a little more patient this year because I always jump the gun because I get excited, and the next thing you know, I'm replanting some things, <laughs> and then I end up being later than I would have been if I'd have just been patient. So I know a lot of other people struggle with that as well, uh, but I just I, I every year I, I jump the gun and I lose a lot of plants because of it. Uh, also been applying the compost to the garden and kind of working that into the, to the, uh, raised beds and getting that ready. Um, you know, the, the kombucha bug is spreading. I, you know, a few weeks ago I had talked about how I got into making kombucha and I really love the stuff in my, uh, my daughters have really taken to it, especially my oldest daughter. She absolutely loves the stuff. She's drinking it every day. She loves it. And uh, she took it some to work with her and she works at a, a large car dealership and um, some of the salesmen and stuff there, she was sharing it with them. She was bringing them some jars of it and now they're in love with it and they're wanting some scobies and start their own kombucha. So the, the bug is spreading and I love it. Um, how about what's happening at the, the homestead front porch these last few days? Well, these last few days, there's been a lot of conversation around garden preparation and chickens because that's because uh, folks are uh, getting those seeds started and they're they're buying their baby chicks right now. So that has been the dominant conversation in there. But it's been great. There's been some great questions popping up like, how do I do this? How do I mend this in my garden about building raised beds? You know, what's wrong with my seedlings? I mean, just lo lots of good information floating around in there. If you want to be a part of that awesome group of more than 20,000 homesteaders, and not just homesteaders, but it's also made up a lot of those who are aspiring to be homesteaders, just folks checking it out. Uh, there's be, there'll be a link in the show notes, click on that banner or just search Facebook for the homestead front porch, Facebook group. And, uh, all you have to do to join is, is request to join and answer a couple questions and we'll get you right in there. It's a great, great group. I think you'll really enjoy it. And, uh, I, I, 
still think it's probably the best thing we have going on here. It really is. It's extremely active and it's just, uh, there's a lot going on, a lot of great questions and answers and just some great community. You know, sometimes folks are in there and they're just having some fun and they're meeting each other and they're supporting one another. And, uh, I've you, all over Facebook, you're going to run into these groups where, you know, they may have a lot of people, but there's just a lot of garbage going on in there. You just don't see that in the front porch. It's just so much support and, uh, and encouragement going on in there. And I'll tell you, uh, we have some great moderators and, uh, they're less tolerant than I am. <laughs> and if there is any of that garbage going on in there, they usually get rid of it pretty quick. If you know what I mean, they're, they usually don't aren't in there very long. If you join with the intent of stirring up some trouble. So, uh, yeah, the moderators, they're doing a great job and I, I appreciate all of them and everything they do. So yeah, get in the front porch. If you're not in there already, you'll really enjoy it. So on to our main topic of discussion, destructive insect control for organic gardening. You've been planning your garden. Now's the time. If you haven't been planning it, it's time. You know, uh, you got to think about what you're going to grow, how much you're going to grow, uh, where you're going to grow, it, etc. Um, one thing you should be considering, however, is how do I plant a garden that is most resistant towards destructive garden insects? You know, those, uh, those kind of insects, those enemies of the garden, they can make your dream garden an absolute nightmare. And there's a lot of ways of dealing with pests. And, uh, but I think like most things in life, a, a good, uh, defense starts with a good offense. If you think about and plan this out ahead of time, you can save yourself a little bit of misery later. No doubt about it. So I think it's important first to know your enemy. It's important to know what you need to defend against. There are a lot of insects that are harmful for your garden, but there's also a lot of insects that are really good for your garden. You, you need to do some study. You need to find out what insects are common in your area. You need to know what attracts them, what they like, what they don't like, uh, which ones are good, which ones are bad. I think this information is going to be really helpful. You know, this podcast goes out all over the world. We have listeners from everywhere, all over the country, all over the world. And for me to nail down and tell you specifically what you need to be worried about, I, I can't because I'm going to have to be a little bit vague on a few things in this episode. Although I am going to talk about a few of the of the ones I'm having trouble with because that's what I have experience with. But you're going to have to do your own research. You're going to have to find out what the insects are in your area and how to deal with them, really. Um, but I'm going to tell you a little bit how you can do that. You do want to attract or bring in the right insects. That that's a that's a given. If if there are good ones that eat the bad ones, then it makes sense to try to bring in the good ones, right? Uh, so they can eat those bad ones. <laughs> you know, that's some groundbreaking stuff right there, isn't it? Um, it's a, it's a simple concept, but it's amazing how many people don't think like this in the, in the minds of many, all bugs in the garden are bad. And that just isn't the case. It's, it's this wrong thinking is, is what leads people to use an abundance of pesticides that kill all the bugs. You know, uh, uh, BT is a common organic pesticide but i don't use it and and you know i don't if you use it I, you know that's fine i'm not judging you or anything but i don't because it doesn't distinguish against bugs it will kill the good ones and the bad ones so i try some other methods which also can make my life a little more difficult you know here's the thing uh we we wonder why folks don't use organic methods well the fact is it's a lot more work it really is um it, it isn't as easy to garden in organic methods as it is uh, using spraying your garden with pesticides. Uh, sometimes you have to get in there and do some hard work in your garden. And we're going to talk a little bit about that today. But there are some things you can do to make it easier, like attracting good bugs to your garden. Some plants, you know, flowers, shrubs, trees will attract these. Certain colors attract certain insects. Smells will attract them. Uh, figure out, you know, what the destructive insects are in your area and then find the insects that are their enemies and then do your homework on what it takes to bring them in. Um, it, it may mean you need to plant a certain flower or herb, uh, you know, sporadically throughout your garden area or, or maybe build some sort of water feature to create an environment that draws them in. Whatever it takes, you might want to do what it takes to draw those, those really beneficial insects into your garden area to eat the bad ones. Also, I think another thing you can do when you're planning your garden, and this is really important, is I think you don't want to make it easy for them through your garden design. When you find a certain insect in your area that wreaks havoc on a certain plant, don't make it easy for them to go from plant to plant. 
Planting your identical crops in rows or all together in raised beds makes it very easy for the insects to go from one plant to the next, uh, eating his way to your destruction. Find good companion plants uh, for each of those plants in your garden and alternate your plants. Um, this is a good practice that helps prevent de- disease also from spreading through your garden. I do that with tomatoes. Uh, you know, tomatoes are pretty prone to certain diseases. So I'll have tomatoes in one part of my garden. I'll have them in another part of my garden. And I just kind of uh, uh, separate them and move them around. I do, I do that with a lot of different plants. I plant them differently in different beds. Now, I try to always put them with things they'll grow well with. You have to do your research on that. You don't want to plant, you know, certain things next to other things. But definitely moving your plants around and not just planting them in rows where, you know, a bug can just go from plant to plant to plant all the way down through your garden, destroying your garden. If you move things around a little bit uh, and space them out, it does make it more difficult. So I think being a good garden designer like that helps. I think it makes a good looking garden too. You get a lot of variety. You get it doesn't make harvest quite as easy because you have to kind of bounce around your garden a little bit to, to get certain things. But man, I think it makes a garden uh, look nice. You know, you just don't have all these identical plants together. You have them kind of spaced out and moved around and. And it gives a lot of uh, variety to your garden. Well, let's just talk about the hands-on methods. With organic gardening, that's the deal. I mean, you're going to have to get in there and you're going to have to find the problems. You're going to have to work the problems with your hands. I wish I could just tell you that it's as easy as, as growing uh, your garden in a way that just uses pesticides. But it's not. You have to get in there. I think it's worth the trouble. I think your garden's going to be much healthier for you to consume. And I actually think it's going to bring a level of enjoyment to your life. I like getting in my garden and working. I like looking under the leaves for problems. I like, you know, searching through it. I like knowing my garden. I love spending time in there. Not everybody has time for that. I understand. But I think to have a really good functioning, uh, productive, organic garden, you got to you gotta start with some hands-on methods. And what I'm going to talk about here is I'm going to talk about some of the problems I've had in my garden. I have a few common pests. Not everybody's going to have these pests. You may have different problems, but these are the these are the pests that I know that I deal with in my garden, and what I have to do to to control them. And some of them I'm still learning how to control them because they're tough. They really are. I think um, we'll start with aphids. Aphids are a common garden pest. Most people are probably going to deal with these little boogers. Uh, they're the easiest to get rid of, though. They're a very delicate little bug, uh, but they're quick to destroy crops if they're not dealt with. Uh, to remove aphids from plants, use a spray bottle. Uh, with a little soapy water, they're going to die off and fall off. You can wash them right off the leaves. Um, you can use an organic, environmentally friendly uh, a soap. I just use a dish soap. I'll use just a little bit of a Dawn dish soap, and I'll kind of wipe them off. It doesn't take very much. Uh, you can actually just blast them off with water and, and, and get them off your plants. Um, but there are some special garden soaps, some organic garden soaps for this purpose. You can also use um, uh, neem oil. Or a spray made from, uh, now I've never tried this, but I've heard of people using this, a spray that's made from um, uh, peppers to discourage them from being on your plants, uh, just like some hot peppers, and kind of grind it up and soak it in some water and, and use that water to spray on your plants, and I heard that uh, deters them. Uh, I would be delicate with that, though. Like I said, it doesn't take a lot to get rid of aphids. You, you can blast them off with water and, and get rid of them for a while, but uh but it doesn't take a lot. So you don't have to get crazy with getting rid of aphids. Also, aphids are a favorite food of ladybugs and other insects. So inviting those insects into your garden can go a long way. Uh, uh, last year, I actually purchased ladybugs and praying mantis and brought them on my property and turned them loose to kind of help with the um, the aphid problem. I had a pretty good little aphid problem the year before, and I thought, well, you know, and I was out there working the garden a lot. So this was what something I had done to try to kind of ease the labor up on that a little bit. And you know what? I didn't even notice any aphids last year. I had a lot of ladybugs out there, and I didn't notice any aphids. I didn't. I mean, it wasn't a problem. Uh, so it's it, it does work. I'm I'm sure of that. Um, so you can purchase those. I mean, you can go on Amazon or or, or someplace and and buy ladybugs. I bought ladybugs and I bought a uh, bought some uh, uh, praying mantis sacks. So I had a lot of baby praying mantis running around here too. I noticed them eating eating up the uh, the bad insects. So you can if you can't invite the uh, uh, draw in the uh, the beneficial insects, you can purchase them and bring them on your property. You know, a lot of people have trouble with that, especially with the praying mantis, because certain um, species of praying mantis aren't native 
to certain areas and a lot of the ones you buy won't be the ones that are native to your area and they can cause some problems and people will say, well, you know, they can kill your hummingbirds and things like that. And uh, you might want to do your research on that and find out what's native to your area and try to bring in the right kind of insects. Ladybugs, I don't, I don't think are an issue, but someone might know of an issue with bringing in ladybugs, but, um, I know they work, <laughs> they really work. So bringing in some ladybugs and they're inexpensive. They're not a lot of money to buy them and they will save you some labor uh, by bringing them in. Another insect that I've had to deal with quite a bit are cabbage worms. Um, they're a big garden pest for me. In early spring, you're going to see these beautiful white butterflies flying around your garden. But don't be fooled. <laughs> they are there to cause you problems. Uh, I remember a couple of years ago, um, you know, I knew what they were. My wife wasn't so sure what they were. And uh, she was talking about them. She's like, oh, look at all them pretty white butterflies flying around in the garden. That's just beautiful. And I'm like, no. And I go running out there and I run in the garage and I grab a, a badminton racket. and I go out there and just start knocking them out of the air. And she's kind of looking at me. And I walk back up to the house after I had them all kind of laying down and I'm breathing hard. And, and you know, and all, the, all of them are dead. And I walk back up and she's looking at me like, what is wrong with you? And I'm like, no, no, you don't understand. They were going to lay these eggs on my on my broccoli and my cabbage that were going to destroy <laughs> But, uh, yeah, she's looked at me a lot over the last few years like that. Um, but, uh, yeah, I mean, they're, they're out there causing you some problems. They're laying those eggs on, on your, on your, uh, cabbage, your broccoli, and they're going to, they're going to turn into these really hard to find green, um, larva, uh, maggots that are going to destroy your plant. They're, they look like little caterpillars. They're little green caterpillars. They're not really disgusting or anything. They're just little, I mean, they, they're easy to pick off. Um, and the best way to deal with those culprits is good old manual labor. When you start seeing any kind of damage on your on your cabbage or your broccoli, um, look under the leaves for the eggs uh, before that, uh, hopefully, and, and wipe them off with a damp cloth. It doesn't take a lot to get them off. Um, but once you start seeing the damage, you're going to have to be diligent to find the worm. It's in there. It's in there somewhere. And you just got to go in there and, and keep looking under the leaves and around things until you find it. And then pick them off. And by the way, chickens and quail love those little worms, those little larvae. They, they'll gobble them up. So I just usually walk out there with a little bowl or something and just kind of drop them all in there as I find them and uh, feed them to your animals. They love them. But, uh, yeah, those little white butterflies, they're, they're, you gotta, you see those out in the garden, get rid of them. I mean, it sounds horrible to run out there and destroy something, but there's plenty of them around. You're not, you're not hurting the environment by, by getting rid of a few of those because they are going to cause you some problems. Um, cutworms and slugs. I kind of put these two together because the damage is similar and the defense for them is similar. I have problems with both. Cutworms are the larvae of, of moths. Um, which lay eggs, just those little brown grayish moths that fly around. They're, they're the larvae of those. And then the legs, the eggs will overwinter. And then in early spring, they come out and destroy your garden by cutting your seedlings off at the stems. Uh, you've bought, probably seen that. You've seen some seedlings that are just laying there and they just look like someone took a pair of scissors and just chopped them off at the base. That, that's a cutworm. And slugs will do that too. And, uh, some common organic practices, for protecting your seedlings from cutworms is to surround your, your, your plant with uh, coffee grounds or maybe some crushed egg shells. Um, this also works with, with slugs. That's why I put them together. But you can also use diatomaceous earth around your plants. Now, when it gets wet, it's not going to work. Uh, it, it just becomes kind of soft and they'll go right over the top of it once it's wet. But especially when you're in a greenhouse or, or, you know, under some protection, when these pests are going to cause you some problems, um, you know, putting some diatomaceous or sprinkling a little diatomaceous earth around the plants will keep them from getting to it. It'll also stop other insects as well. It's a diatomaceous earth is a, it's a really sharp dust that when they crawl over it, it actually slices them up and, and it will, it will kill them, um, eventually, but, um, it'll, it'll deter a lot of insects, but again, it doesn't, uh, really, uh, make the distinction between a good or bad bug, but you don't have a lot of good insects that are walking over it. Um, most of your beneficials are probably flying in and landing on your plants. Uh, so uh, it's not a real big issue. I do use some some diatomaceous earth around some of my, my plants for protecting against certain insects. So that's one of the ways you can go. For slugs specifically, though, you can also submerge a bowl 
in your garden where the rim is at ground level. And then you can just fill the bowl with beer and slugs will crawl in and actually drown themselves in the beer. Um, I actually can't do this anymore because I have a dog that likes to get in the garden and drink the beer. (laughs) So, um, yeah, I can't really use that one. So your dogs will run in your garden and drink all your beer up (laughs) right with the slugs in it and all. Um, but, uh, yeah, that does work though to get rid of some slugs. A predator, this is, I thought was fascinating. I didn't even actually know this until I was doing a little bit more research, but a predator to the cutworm as well as slugs, snails, and aphids are the lightning bug. Um, so doing things to attract lightning bugs to your garden can actually help. And I thought that was pretty cool. Everybody likes seeing some lightning bugs fly around their, uh, their, uh, their gardens. And, uh, I didn't know that they were actually doing you some good. So they are, a, uh, they're a predator to these things so they can help control that. So, uh, instead of letting your kids just run out and gather them all up in jars and kill them, maybe we should just kind of let them fly around and eat the uh, bad stuff out of our garden. Right. Um, here's the next couple I'm going to mention. And the last couple I'm going to mention are, are my nemesis <laughs> insects. These ones cause me a lot of trouble and I've had trouble controlling them. I really have, uh, squash bugs are, are a bad one. Uh, this is one that requires diligent inspection of your plants, uh, for the eggs and the bugs to control them. And, um, they kind of look like a stink bug. They're a little flatter, a little longer. I tell you, they're, they're, they're trouble. They'll destroy your, your squash laying a board on the ground around your squash plants provides a place for them to kind of congregate underneath during the night. So it'll help you find them. So in the mornings you can go out there and just lift the board up and there'll be a whole bunch of them on the underside of that board. And then you can just crush them early in the morning. Um, also, uh, companion planting I hear, and I haven't tried this, but this year it's going to have happen. I've heard that planting nasturtium, uh, with your squash helps to repel squash bugs. I'm going to be trying that this year. So I don't know that for sure, but I've read that on several articles. So I have had some, some squash bug issues, especially last year. They, they hit me pretty hard last year. Uh, my squash were pretty devastated, but not just by squash bugs. Also the squash vine borer, which I'll talk about next. These little boogers, they'll attack your squash, your zucchini, your pumpkins, your gourds, and they prefer Hubbard squash, and they're not a fond of butternut squash, which I did find that out. I mean, I read that before, and I had butternut, and I noticed that uh, I had problems with my other squash, but I did not have any problem with my butternut. Well, I like butternut, so uh, butternut's going to become a more of a dominant squash that I'm growing for sure. Um, I had a, some spaghetti squash that they just tore up. Like, I, I didn't even realize it. Like, I'd pick them, the actual... Um, squash was still looking pretty good and I didn't really look it over and I'd cut them open and I would find the, uh, the larva inside the squash. That's how, and I mean, they just kind of made a little tiny hole, got in there and I didn't even know they were in there, but they come through the vines and, and, uh, oh, they're just, they'll, they'll devastate your, your squash. These things are the, they're the larvae of the clear wing moths. They look a little like a, a black and orange wasp. They're really different looking and, uh, they lay dormant in cocoons in the soil until midsummer. And then they emerge and they lay eggs at the base of the stem. So that's important to know because that's where we're going to look for the eggs. The, the larva, uh, then when they hatch, they kind of bore into the stem and they, they work their way up the stem. And they feed for about two to four weeks and, and, and then they can even get into the fruit eventually. Like I said, I've, I've found to be true. Really the best control for these things, for everything I've read and everything I've done myself is just to look for the eggs before they hatch at the base of the stems and, uh, get them, get rid of them. Um, and that's about the best way to do it because <laughs> after they hatch, it's very difficult to control, to control them organically. Um, one method I've heard of is trapping the, uh, the adult moths, uh, with yellow sticky traps and, and yellow colored bowls of soapy water. So I'm going to be trying that. I'm going to be putting some yellow, you know, bowls out in my, around those plants, uh, with some soapy water in them. And seeing if that works, see if I can catch a few of them, you know, drown them out and uh, kind of control them a little bit. And crop rotation, I'm told, helps with these a lot because, again, they're overwintering in cocoons in the soil near the plants. So if you can move your plants, I mean, obviously they're a moth, they can fly, but it they do crawl out and start laying eggs pretty quickly. And they're going to stay relatively close to home. So if you can move them to a, a further place in your garden from where they originally were, you know, just doing some good crop rotation could help some 
uh, with controlling these pests. Very difficult. And, I, you know, I never really had a huge problem with this until last year. Last year was pretty bad for me on the squash bugs and the squash vine borers. I had them both pretty heavy. And um, I got uh, very little squash because of it. They, they devastated my crop uh, except for my butternut. Again, the butternut did really, really well. But I had trouble with everything else because of that. So I'm going to be trying the companion planting with the nasturtium. I'm going to be really diligent about uh, inspecting my stems and my leaves for eggs for both of these bugs. Um, I'm going to be trying the yellow uh, bowl with some soapy water in my garden. And, um, and I will be moving uh, where I planted them last year to a different place in the garden, see if that helps as well. Because boy, oh boy, it was it was uh, an ongoing battle late in the year last year with uh, with my squash. So hopefully those give you some ideas of what you can start doing in your garden. Those are the insects I'm dealing with. For me to try to cover a whole bunch of different insects that I'm not dealing with, for people who are just in different places, it, it's just it's difficult. But do your homework. Look for those good bugs. Find out what your bad bugs are. Uh, practice some of the uh, the things we talked about and. Uh, those are just some, some simple steps you can take to um, controlling the destructive insects in your organic garden and giving you a better harvest. Uh, some of these things have worked very well for me. Uh, for some people, it's very difficult. Organic gardening can be very difficult because it does require more time in the garden. But there are a few things you can do, like bringing in the good insects to do the work for you, that will help. So there you have it, folks. Um, just some ways to help you uh, have a more productive, better, and more enjoyable garden. Because it's not a lot of fun to go out there and just find your crops devastated by these little critters. That's for sure. Uh, one book I want to recommend today. Uh, this one has given me some ideas, and, and I didn't talk about all the things in there. I'm still looking through it. I just got it. It's the Organic Gardener's Handbook of Natural Pest and Disease Control. It says it's a complete guide to maintaining a healthy garden and yard the earth-friendly way. So I'll put a link to that book in the uh, the show notes. I've picked that up, I have, and I haven't spent a lot of time in it. I didn't have it last year for my garden, so I'm going to be trying some of the methods out of that book this year. But it looks there's a lot of great information in it that might help you uh, control the pests in your garden and the, and the disease. It also covers disease control. Uh, so pick up that book if you are struggling with the insects and disease problems in your garden. I think it'd be a really... A uh, handy one to have around on your bookshelf. So, uh, yeah, the Organic Gardener's Handbook of Natural Pest and Disease Control. And by the way, if you uh, want to find the the links I'm talking about today, um, this is episode 80. So go to your uh, go to smalltownhomestead.com forward slash 80, and it'll take you to the show notes for this episode where you can find those links. Okay, the new segment, the Homestead Life, and this is a segment where I just want to share uh, something that's better in my life because of homesteading. And uh, yesterday, uh, I had the day off. It was a holiday. Uh, and I enjoyed a whole rabbit marinated in uh, in a garlic rosemary mix that I cooked in the smoker. Um, all the food in that meal came from my backyard. And it was better than anything I could have bought in a restaurant, in my opinion. Uh, the recipe, I'll just share the recipe real quickly uh, with you for that, that rabbit. Um, I just cut the rabbit in eight pieces, the legs, uh, two pieces from the loin and, and two from the ribs, uh, placed them in a, in a Ziploc bag, added some, uh, a little bit of olive oil. I minced the garlic and, and, and chopped the rosemary and added them in there. I added the rabbit and I just kind of mixed it all up and got the, got the uh, rabbit really good and coated. I seasoned it with a little salt and pepper. And I let it set for uh, a couple hours, and you could let it set overnight. It'd really just soak in there and do better. I just let it set for a couple hours. And uh, I tossed them in my smoker with some hickory uh, for about two and a half hours at 220 degrees. And I just made sure the meat was at around 160 degrees in the center. And I'll tell you, it was great. I mean, it was fantastic. If you don't have a smoker, this is also an excellent way to go uh, for the grill as well. Um, because I know someone's going to ask me uh, for a link to the smoker I have, it's the master built 30 inch digital electric smoker. I'll put a link in the show notes to that. I actually didn't buy it. Uh, my daughter uh, got it for us for a Christmas gift 
uh, last year, and uh, I'm loving it. And it's it's one of the cheaper models for sure, but it does a great job. It does a great job. Uh, we cooking rabbits, chicken. Uh, we've tried uh, all kinds of things in there. I mean, uh, we've done some uh, uh, pork chops. We've done a lot of things in there, and it just does a great job. And I'm I'm just looking at all the different recipes we're going to be using this year in that thing, and and. Uh, and like I said, there's a higher end smokers out there, probably much better smokers out there, but I like this one. Also, if you're cooking rabbit, it's going to be a little drier. It has a, uh, if you have a smoker like this, it has the uh, water tray in the bottom so you can keep some moisture in the uh, um, smoker. And some for some things, it recommends you don't put any water in that tray. Uh, for rabbit, though, you absolutely have to, to to keep that rabbit from getting real dry. Uh, some things will hold their, you know, I think if you used like doing maybe a bacon wrap or something on your rabbit, you probably wouldn't have to do that. But for for uh, doing what this recipe, you definitely want to add some water to the tray to keep a little moisture in, in the smoker. But an absolutely fantastic meal. And uh, wouldn't have had that meal if it wouldn't have been for homesteading. That's a result of me being in an urban homestead being able to to have a meal like that and that's that's a common practice around here so uh, i just want to tell you the homestead life is worth living if you're just an aspiring homesteader and you're thinking one day i want to do that don't wait do it right where you're at get started there are things you can do to make your life more enjoyable better right where you're at so get out there and enjoy that homestead life hey i want to take a minute and tell you guys about the homestead forum membership community it's what makes this podcast possible um lots of stuff going on there you know I, I'm I'm really enjoying this community. Uh, I started this uh, this membership as kind of a replacement to Patreon originally. I, I I wanted some way for people to support this podcast, the work we're doing, uh, be able to to kind of help me pay the bills on it. But I'm going to tell you, this Homestead Forum membership community is turning into so much more than that. Um, it's becoming its own thing. It really is. It's not just a way to support this podcast. It's it's a community. And uh, there's going to be a lot of education going in there. I'm working on courses in there. There's videos up in there. There's a weekly uh, live discussion I'm doing in there. There's extra podcasts every week going in there. Folks, this thing is great. Plus, we got the discounts from other um, folks for their products in there that you're going to get for being a member. Real low price. Uh, it does a lot to support this podcast. And uh, I think it's going to turn into something really, really big. I've actually uh, joined another membership that I'm in that's teaching me a few things. I'm actually taking some courses on uh, learning about building and uh, uh, properly operating a membership site and podcast, uh, learning a lot about marketing those things, learning about uh, setting up like forums. And, and I've been doing that for the last couple of weeks. So I, I'm actually in another community where I'm learning how to be a, to do better for you guys as a podcaster and as a, as somebody who's running a membership uh, community. So it's actually been kind of really busy for me lately because I've been going through those courses. <laughs> you noticed I actually uh, didn't have a podcast out last week. And actually, I'll just go ahead and fess up. Probably for the next couple episodes, they're probably going to come out bi-weekly. And then we're going to get back on track at coming out weekly. But that thing's turning out to be a great uh, little site. And I hope you'll join and support this podcast if you enjoy it. For more information about that, just go to smalltownhomestead.com. And in the menu there, you'll see the uh, the tab for uh, join the Homestead Forum membership community. And you can get more information there and look into signing up. I uh, also appreciate those who uh, support this podcast by sharing this podcast, by leaving an iTunes review, telling other people about it. Uh, it goes a long way to growing our podcast. And let me tell you, folks, this podcast has grown a lot in the last couple of years, a lot. Um, thank you for sharing and turning on others onto this uh, this podcast and uh, and leaving those reviews. I think it goes a lot for uh, social proof. It helps people decide whether they want to listen to this podcast or not by reading your reviews in their uh, iTunes and other places. So leave those reviews. I always appreciate them, and it uh, it really helps a lot. So thank you for that. Well, I hope you enjoyed this episode, everyone. And until the next episode, happy homesteading and God bless. Thanks for listening. To see the show notes for this podcast or listen to other podcast episodes, go to smalltownhomestead.com. There you can also read our blog, connect with us on Facebook, Twitter, and Google+, and take advantage of the many resources we make available to help you along in your homesteading journey. Please share this podcast and help us to carry out our mission of helping others to homestead today for a better tomorrow.